figures. I mean, if you, when you go home on your way, stop at a bookstore and look for it. What did I do? Frank O'Hara is a, I don't know where to start. He was just a, because of the siren. Stay close to the closer. <laughs> I have trouble hearing anyway, and I gotta hear this. They're usually they go off pretty quickly now, but uh, that one, that guy seems to have a, a real idea that he's gonna stop somebody from opening his car. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Frank O'Hara, I wrote about it, and uh, I was, we were friends a long time. He died fairly young in, in relation to the amount of time I've gone through since he died. He was, uh, he was a poet in the main, but also he started as a musician. Uh, he, uh, he was homosexual and very sort of aroused every minute. And in those days, I think that, uh, it seemed, I don't mean that it was that different for heterosexuals, but I mean, it seemed as if the crowd of men that I went that I saw and everything like that. The whole thing was to sort of go to a different bar every night. And so there was a great deal of emphasis on the whole thing about sex and meeting people. And somebody controlled this and made it louder? Yeah, is there a control? Yeah. Anyway, but he wrote poetry uh, like, you know, all the time and was very interested. And he, he had a great deal of interest in art. And he also was a kind of a very enthusiastic person who came to your studio quite often and had a lot of ideas about your work and very inspiring in that sense. He also was a very difficult person. He drank, so up till about, you know, 10, 11 o'clock, he was very rational. And so for some after about 11, 30, 12 o'clock, you began to hear a certain thing creep into his voice. So. Like anything, we can go into his character. I, I did it in the book. He, I could, from my own point of view about Frank, he was very inspiring to me. I knew him a long time, and uh, I, uh, I was very upset, you know, with his death. I mean, he was, I suppose, my best friend, and he, uh, but he, he became. He not only, he, he started out at the Museum of Modern Art at the desk selling. Uh, Christmas cards, and he ended up a curator of, of uh, American painting in the museum, at the Museum of Modern Art. So we have, a, a, from that certain point of view, I mean, it didn't even interest him, and he suddenly is, you know, a curator of art. He, he just was interested in art by, because he had friends who painted, and that was a social relationship to people, to be, we're all interested in what, you know, the people close to us are doing, or at least we, seemed to feel that we have to pretend an interest, and he, he did. And so he was, he was sort of extraordinary. He put on shows at the museum. He wrote articles. He, he actually became powerful. It became very com complicated as he got older because he had this relationship to the Museum of Modern Art. He also then had to be more circumspect about his private opinions. He, so people who were close to him felt, you know, that they couldn't sort of say to him, Hey, why don't you come over and see my paintings? And then say, well, how about a show at the Museum of Modern Art or something like that? So he had to, he had to skirt a very fine line, and uh, somehow it, we managed. And uh, he, uh, he was a pre-AIDS person. He, he got killed on a beach in uh, on Long Island, Fire Island, something like that. Uh, I think I said it best in the book. Uh, you know, it's hard to just give you an idea of what's important. I think his poetry was very inspiring too, very personal, and uh, very odd. I mean, always mentioning things about music or history or things like that, or things, facts that he knew. They were very rich, the poetry, and color, had a lot of color in them and things like that. Did he bring a lot of people together? Yeah, I mean, he was like a central, Broadcasting, I mean, like a central switchboard. I mean, he knew people that I was, in a sense, because of our friendship, forced to meet. I'm not sure that I would have had anything to do with him if it weren't for him. But he, he was, and it was good. He liked to go to parties, we'd go to parties. I mean, in other words, he was a friend of mine, what can I say? I, uh, 
They've been asked over the years, no lot to talk about him, to say this, say that about him. I, I think I said it in the book, more or less, in a way that would give you a clear idea of what I thought, what I felt about him, and what he was, was about. Uh, there was a book by Brad Gooch, if you're really interested in Frank O'Hara, it was, it was quite good, very informative. What do you say we all get up en masse and go out and trash that car? Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Go trash that yeah. car. Yeah, that's the longest I've ever heard. <laughs> Let's just be zen, guys. Wait, we're going to have to listen to it until the battery goes down. Um, Should we call it a night? That we call it <laughs> Right. Are you getting tired? One more question. Are you getting tired? One more question. I'm not getting tired, but I, I, I'm annoyed. Yeah. 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 Right over here, Sons of Shirts. I'd like to ask one question. Uh, the word abstract just popped out in a conversation a short while ago, and I'd like to use the abstract in a most generally accepted way. It's, you know, I know you have your own philosophy and concept on what abstract and what is not abstract, but if I use the word abstract in the most general sense, who is your favorite abstract painter or artist, if you have any? Painter? Uh, let's see. My favorite abstract painter. Well, you hit me at the wrong point. I mean, I was much more, you know, open about him when I was younger and things like that, that I thought these guys are good. I knew a lot of them, things like that personally. I now feel as if, I now feel as if, uh, I mean, because of my present feeling about things in general, that uh, it was an art that was like closer to music. I mean, that it was about space and movement and energy and things like that. It never said anything about anything in life. And I suddenly feel as if I started calling, I mean, I'd find myself days sort of saying these, that, that it's mindless. But it's not mindless because, after all, Mozart's not mindless. So that, I think of it in that area, but I do think that to have lived a whole life and never passed an opinion in, with your work, I mean, that about things in life and things like that seems odd. So who I like as an abstract painter? I like de Kooning at a certain point in his painting. Now I sort of like, I don't really know. I don't really know what I like. Think I think that Pollock's things are sort of pretty in a way, you know, for a, do you, I knew him too well. Do you well. define de Kooning as an abstract painter? Well, would say from a certain point. From about 1948 on, he was a, an abstract painter, except for a brief period, the women. And I have one more question. When do you, when do you, how do you know when your painting's finished? How do I know what? How, how do you know when the painting is finished you're working on? Oh, how do I know when the painting's finished? Well, for years I used to give a very, you know, slimy answer that if I can't think of what to put in or take out, <laughs> the painting is finished, you know. But sometimes recently I've decided that there's a, I have a character flaw in relation to painting that I sort of get nervous about painting and keep painting and painting and I have no way of knowing that I've improved it just because I keep working on it. So I, I give myself a, a sort of a deal. I say, well, look, I'm going to work the whole day today. If finished or not, I'm going to walk away from it. So I do that sometimes. So. One more question. I'm very greedy. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, uh, uh, what do you think of critics in general? What do I think of critics? I think they're important. I mean, they have, you know, it's a democracy. Everybody can have an opinion. Uh, I think that uh, I, I can't think of any critic who ever said anything that helped me paint. But I, uh, they, they're valuable in bringing you to the attention of the public and the, the person knows you've done something and the things like, oh, that you have a show on or that things like that and that people hear about it. It's like anything else. It's like advertisement, really. And uh, I find that valuable. Uh, what they say, uh, maybe I don't read enough of them. Actually, I think that there's something wrong with me. I kind of got a hillbilly streak in me where I don't really read about it that much. I, I don't, I mean, I know a lot of them and they don't seem to me to be that impressive. Uh, 
I've had books written about me and things like that, and I sort of appreciate that, you know, they do this and they spend time, and I don't even know how they can bear it. But uh, as far as saying anything, I, I doesn't, it isn't that valuable. It doesn't ever say anything that I didn't think, I mean, in a negative way, they say things that I didn't think of. But they very rarely say things that were, that seem to be, like, put things together that are agreeable, whether they like it or not. Most of them are, are, seem to be talking about that they don't like it or that they like it. And then people, critics repeat stories and things like that. They were lazy, like a lot of people, and they, they take the writings of, you know, but I suppose major critics and important critics and things like that would be different. I don't read that much of them. So there it is. Thank you. For those of you who are watching, our program on cable, why don't you come down to Soho and join us there at 144 Mercer Street, Fulcrum Gallery, um, and take a part of uh, Art History Home with you. 8.30, Thursday nights. You'll see us on TV, but on Friday at 8, you can come to Soho. Thank you. In other words, you don't have any that I could buy. Sorry. Things like that. Is you're going to interpret that your work is exciting. In other words, are you going to be able to see that work separate from the joy you're experiencing from the music? So I, I had a few years there where I wouldn't listen to music. I was going to just listen to something else. And... Uh, it got, it got to be silly after a while, you know. I, I, but I don't do it at the beginning of a work, usually. Are you, are you still painting actively now? What do you mean by active? <laughs> Paint, painting every day. I, I think about it. I paint every day, plus weekends and things like that. But then uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I seem to be at a period now where, I mean, when I, when I go to a bar after this, we can spend four hours where I just uh, don't know exactly where it's going to go. And so I've also started to think, look, okay, you painted every day of your life, all the time. You were very sure you were painting. You were identifying yourself every time you got out of bed. I'm a painter. And I used to go to, into my studio pretty early and work. Uh, there were uh, certain distractions that uh, normal human distractions, and uh, I would, uh, as a young man, uh, you know, give in to these uh, temptations. But uh, now I, I'm beginning to wonder whether just to just paint is sort of sounds like a neurotic activity. <laughs> you know, you got to paint. How can you how can you live the day without being identified? How can you live the day without? Doing some work. I mean, who are you? You're just like a very ordinary person. That felt cool and nice. But anyway, so I, when I have an idea, for instance, I am leaving for Florida tomorrow. And just yesterday, I began uh, some idea, very complicated to explain, but I felt there was something about it that struck me that I could finish it in about a day and a half, a certain part of the work. I work all day and all evening and everything like that, so I did that. So I'm more now compelled on the basis of specific things instead of just going. But I, 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 I guess I'm one of these people that has an idea a minute in a certain way when I was young. And so now I'm just changing. I'm just wondering what is important, what is the difference between your earlier days ideal, the ideals of your earlier day where you were sure about uh, that the, the main thing was to be modern or somehow I had a kind of classic and things like that. So I have a question for you. Um, in relation to the painting itself, are you more interested in the process of painting or in the finished product? What's the first part? Process? 
the process of painting oh. or the finished product? Are you more interested? Both. <laughs> why, 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 why? What did you want to know? I don't know. Maybe specifically from me, or yeah. do you want to know uh, because you. you want to know about yourself? Well, I'm thinking of it for myself, but I'm curious. Are you interested in process and the finished product? It's a struggle between the two. It's a struggle. Between the two. Okay. And I wanted to know if, what you go through. Two hearts that swing in waltz time. We're, we're about the same. I mean, there's something about that. I, I, I'm interested in the process, naturally, you, because that's how you get a finished product. You can only go through a certain <laughs> process. And so, you know, I, I'm interested in all along. How, how can I paint? I'm not interested in the process. Whether certain paintings which are, are leaving traces of the, how what you, know, you went through are important to me, I think there are people who painted that way, that they wanted you to know what they went through with scumbles and crossings out, things like that, erasures and all that. Uh, and it had a certain value, I think, you know. Uh, why, why shouldn't the subject matter of painting change? I mean, they can become, it's almost anything today. So you can make out of it whatever you want. If you want to make process the most important thing, I will now be looking at a painting which an artist is telling me something is process. I'll, I'll be amazed or, you know, whatever. So, are you, are, you know, for yourself, uh, you have to decide what you want. Or your painting tells you what you want. I was curious, though, uh, in terms of what's happened in the art world the last 20 years, uh, what is the significance of you to people like uh, Schnabel or Fischl or even the minimalist movement? Uh, you know, have you been... Uh, have you had any passion and concerns one way or the other, positive or negative, or you know, has it influenced your work? So uh, to pass opinions on movements and what's important and what's unimportant, uh, that is a bygone period. Clement Greenberg, I think, made a big fuss, who I don't know how much of you have heard of him or read anything he wrote. I actually knew him, not very well, you know, but I knew him. Go to, well, you know, well enough days, to fight with you know, <laughs> You know someone, if you go to four parties with them, you say, oh, yeah, I know that guy. I showed up at four parties. <laughs> and uh, he uh, made a, a great thing about major and minor paintings. In other words, a certain kind of painting was major, a certain kind of was minor. So I, I, I feel as if, do you grow up thinking you're going to not make the same mistakes as your parents? So I think that and growing up, I, I, I don't want to sound like him, so I, I can't, I don't know what's really important and what's not important. Your relationship with Greenberg. At, at the beginning, he supported you. He was one of your biggest supporters in the early 50s. And then there, there seemed to have been a rift. Could you articulate uh, a the rift relationship with, with Clean, Greenberg? You're yes, Clement about? Greenberg. Oh, you wanted me to talk about the rift? Well, no, everything. A rift involves a romance, right? Uh, well, what do you, I'm not sure I understand what you want to hear. Do we, uh, well, how we disagreed intellectually, or he was an early supporter of yours uh, when you. Started. That's not true. Uh, uh, On top of it, I mean, the reason that I I got to I admired him for a very long time. I, uh, that's why I say to sit here and talk after I've spent a whole chapter on it in my right. book becomes sort of like it's like you know a, a drop in the bucket. I, uh, Clem Greenberg wrote a very terrific article of my first exhibition, at which I never forgot him for, naturally. But he, uh, it got complicated in the art world, and he, his sort of, finally his ideas began to exclude me. In other words, there was uh, a certain kind of works that he liked, and that they were major works, and everything else was minor works. And usually, anything that had to do with figures was considered not in the mainstream and things like that. And so uh, I, I wouldn't refer to my work as figurative, but somehow I guess in those days you used that term. And there were very big arguments at the artist club and things like that. The uh, does, is there value or is there, is abstract art have any so redeeming social qualities and things like that? And so the, there was always figurative art and abstract art. I think that I don't, consider my work to be figurative art, although there are figures that can be recognized. Greenberg, I guess, 
uh, was very tough, and he was part. He was actually tough in life too. I mean, he uh, he started fights. He so that in a way, maybe his writing was some kind of uh, extension of this aggression that he had in him, and that when it came to writing, he had to make these very hard. He was knocking people out of the ring. You. You can't come. He, I mean, he'd, he'd write a sentence, and it would be as if he struck someone. So crossings out, things like that, erasures, and all that. Uh, and it had a certain value, I think. You know, uh, why? Why shouldn't the subject matter of painting change? I mean, they can become. It's almost anything today. So you can make out of it whatever you want. If you want to make process the most important thing, I will now be looking at a painting in which an artist is telling me something in his process. I'll. I'll be amazed, or you know, whatever. So, are you, are, you know, for yourself, uh, you have to decide what you want, or your painting tells you what you want. How much does the place you're painting affect what? you? How much does the place you're painting affect you? At Southampton, where, where New paint? York, where Miami, yes. It's, uh, I'm very, uh, I guess the old-fashioned work neurotic about it. I seem to want a situation in everything, even in the house. I mean, for instance, how many people have a light switch right next to their bed? The lamp, usually. That's the last thing, and then you put the lamp out, and that's only doing that. But uh, sometimes you don't have lamps, or you... I was in places in Mexico and things like that. I, uh, where uh, the convenience of things weren't as easy. I seem to like my studio because I use certain equipment, because I have to run from one table to another. I, a room, uh, so the places have to be big, usually, although I painted in small places. Oh, you asked the question, I'm talking to you. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> and uh, uh, not that much, for instance, I met, when I was younger, I knew uh, Virgil Thompson. Virgil Thompson spent the 20s in Europe. And one of the things he's very keen on letting you know the first second he met you was how many painters he knew and what their studio was and how important the lights in the atelier were. I cover every skylight I have and everything like that with window shades. I painted in total. Uh, bulb thing. Uh, it's kind of thrilling. There was one or two weeks, I think some before last, where I decided to let the shade go back in a certain painting I was doing, things like that. And it's, it, it is sweet and everything like that, but it just, usually it's, uh, you know, I have to have a place because of the convenience, but I don't seem to be interested in the outside world or looking out at some scene or anything like that. The whole thing is, is internal and looking up photographs and this and projections and Xerox copies of things and all that. It was all like a whole process that doesn't make. If I can have those things on this table, I would, but it can't be possible. Mm -hmm. so, so basically the, the process can go, if you've got the right things around you, the process can go on wherever you are. If, but it has to be pretty big. Yeah. You see. <laughs> Larry, could you tell us a little bit about the, the spirit of the Hoffman period, the spirit of the classes, and the spirit of Hans Hoffman uh, on you know, his sort of influence on the students, who were, many of whom were already painters, and sort of seemed to flock to him you know, magnetically. Yeah. Tell us a little bit there's about the of spirit people, of, of there's those There's a lot of people have written about it. I actually wrote, there's a part in the book about my Hoffman thing because it, while I'm not sure that his talk, maybe it had, now that I get older, his talk had some influence on me, but I still seem to want to keep it, to be about things. I want to tell a story, I wanted to show an object, whatever it was, a figure. He, uh, for a younger person, he, uh, you know, would stroll in the old master twice a week and you would, you know, do, we'd be doing charcoal drawings of these very pretty uh, women in the main. And, uh, but it was always about space, push and pull, 
things like that. In other words, you are suddenly in a situation in which people aren't telling you, you know, you don't have the ear correctly or, I mean, he was, he talked about more movements in painting and things like that. And he uh, mentioned you in relation to Matisse or Michelangelo, things like that. So for the first time in your life, you're being viewed by someone. It's your first review. When you think about it, a teacher is a review. He doesn't get in the paper, but he's telling you what he thinks of what you've just done. And it's quite exciting. He uh, also had a very thick German accent. And so you would hear, yeah, this is good. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, and he mixed in some German words. And uh, you felt as if, I mean, if you didn't have that experience prior to that, there was, it was quite thrilling. And I think that actually, as I think about it, and it even moves over into one's relationship to children. The thing is to just get someone to do something. I don't know how much you could tell anybody that's going to really do them any good. All you can do is draw certain things to their attention, and uh, the rest is up to them. He somehow was like that. He would just talk about certain things. He also was a teacher who had shows. He had wor he did work. He. Uh, had a certain kind of history, you could find him in books. So it, uh, it was more in that, in that uh, realm that you were involved with a sort of a, an important person and he was talking which made you important and it, it was inspirational in a way, I could say that. There were different uh, people there, there were uh, very strict people, you know, you'd see this very beautiful girl posing like this. You go up and there's a guy sitting he's making three squares, three rectangles. <laughs> Seriously, he didn't look at her, he didn't look at her shoulders, that was all boring, her breasts or her knees or thighs. He was just the space between, like, to convey what this is in space, not so much as, you know, a nose, an ear, things like that. So he did, he did manage to convince you of that, but he didn't uh, convince me enough. He actually gave up on me. I, there came a point where I realized that he would come over and say, yeah, it's good, it's pretty good. Never say a word, move on to the next <laughs> person. Hi, Larry. So I was a girl back there. That I was curious as to your thoughts, uh, like Steve asked you about uh, the jazz musicians who were of influence on you, that sort of thing. I was curious though, uh, in terms of what's happened in the art world the last 20 years, uh, what is the significance of you to people like uh, Schnabel or Fischl or even the minimalist movement? Uh, you know, have you been, uh, have you had any passion and concerns one way or the other, positive or negative, or you know, has it influenced your work in general? I'm not talking about stylistically, but whatever. Well, I, I, I remember when I was younger, uh, Louis Armstrong passed a, a remark about Charlie Parker that I found to be very ungenerous. So I, I certainly am not gonna be caught dead making an ungenerous remark about any of those things you mentioned, but I, you know, it's their business, and I, it's okay. I think every one of them have talent in certain ways. Some of them, if you ask me, you know, what do I really think, I, I could give you some pretty strong opinions. You know, I have opinions about them, but I, I just think that, uh, you know, everybody is seeking out a, a, a constituency. And so Newt Gingrich uh, realizes he's not going to be very interesting to certain people and uh, you know uh, Barney Fag, Barney Frank, <laughs> pardon me, uh, isn't going to be interesting to other kinds of people. So I think that all you can do is do what you do. I think that Schnabel, I mean to still today I somehow have a respect, certain kind of admiration for people who can catch public attention. Do me something, what can I do about it? I, that I find is that I don't, you know, I, I, I feel that one should acknowledge that, that it, it's maybe not something I like, things like that, but look, this guy has caught the attention and the interests of a lot of people, a lot of 
students even, you know, people want to paint like them and everything like that. I think that there, came, there was a certain point in painting in New York where the real, the only way that you knew someone had quality was how many imitators he had. <laughs> what can we do? Uh, and perhaps, I don't know, I, today it doesn't seem, I, I don't know enough about what's going on today. I walk around Soho and things like that in a situation like this. So what do I know about Soho? I got out of the cab in the wrong, part, wrong street, or down the street. So we passed a photographic show, or she even said that. Are those photographs or paintings? I said, you know, I don't know. So, uh, and I thought, well, you know, that's what, they, that's what that person is doing. And I could see someone walking in and sort of thinking to themselves, oh, you know, I'd like to have that in my house. And before you know it, if 10 people come in and say the same thing, you suddenly the guy makes a, a headline somewhere. So uh, to pass opinions on movements and what's important and what's unimportant, uh, that is a bygone period. Clement Greenberg, I think, made a big fuss, who, I don't know how much of you heard of him or read anything he wrote. I actually knew him, not very well, you know, but I knew him. We used to go to, well, you know, well enough days, to fight with him. You know, you know someone, if you go to four parties with them, you say, oh yeah, I know that guy, we showed up at four parties. And uh, he uh, made a, a great thing about major and minor paintings, in other words, a certain kind of painting was major, a certain kind of was minor. So I, I, I feel as if, do you grow up thinking you're going to not make the same mistakes as your parents? So I think that in growing up, I, I, I don't want to sound like him, so I, I can't, I don't know what's really important and what's not important. Well, what ideas are you, all right, <laughs> what ideas are you, are you working with now? What am I doing now? Yeah, what ideas are you working with? You want to really hear what I'm doing now? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I think uh, I didn't much like, uh, when I was younger, everybody told me Robert Motherwell was a very heavy intellectual. I, I never read a thing that he said that sounded to me like a heavy intellectual. But he seemed to think he was, and he had a very serious ring in his voice and things like that. And. Uh, he uh, said at one point, which the most to me was the most fascinating thing, I want you to know something, folks, he was somewhere, that a, a painter who makes money and sells his work isn't really, th isn't by nature, that nature of selling work and things like bad. In other words, uh, there were certain ideals that I think he's from the 30s and WPA period and everything like that, and they think that if you, if you sold your works, you were selling out because you were satisfying a certain class of people. I don't think that that exists today. But I get into all sorts of very peculiar social art aesthetic situations. And one of the things is that I made a painting that someone bought and spent, well, what I would consider a considerable amount of money. And then they went somewhere and they saw that the painting that they had bought, they saw something that looked a little like it, of mine. They got very upset, and I received a lawyer's letter from them <laughs> telling me that I sold this work. I didn't even sell the work. I didn't even know they bought it. I mean, I, you know, I, I received the money from it, but I, I don't really know, and I don't take it. Lecture. She finally came to see me. She turns out she's a nice lady, and she, I, I showed her how many of these kind of they were. It was a work of Webster. It was Webster cigar, Daniel Webster, on a cigar box cover. And I seem to have started those in about 1964, and I have never ceased doing it and for a variety of reasons. All things change. There was a, I discovered during the. Uh, uh, the peanut grower president? Carter. 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 Who? 
Carter. During the Carter sort of uh, campaign or something, there was a, a photograph, a very beautiful photograph of Daniel Webster appeared in the newspaper. And I realized that the photograph, uh, the rendition, the illustrator's rendition of Webster on the cigar box top was like a corpse that someone had made, put some lipstick on. I mean, Daniel Webster looked like a corpse and with flowers because it's cigars. He's supposed to not think it smells and things like that. So the subject interested me, and I made many, 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 many paintings. So I brought her over and I said to her, listen, you may have a painting that looks like something, but let me show you what I did. So even though I spent all that time and everything like that, they still didn't <coughs> want to have it. And what can we do to set it? So I decided, we decided that I would make a painting commensurate size and things like that, value and all that. This week, I was working on that. I was solving a problem that had to do with something that took place during the course of my career and things like that. And a lot of those things are coming up. I painted on a, I did a little painting on an acetate. I don't know how many of you use acetate. The value of acetate is that you could trace something, but you could take the thing that you've traced away and you've got this original work, right? Acetate disintegrates. It rhymes, so it must be true. And uh, someone showed up with a camel work that I had done where the, it was crumbling, totally crumbling. I stand behind my product, I'm an American, right, an American corporation. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to do that over. Meanwhile, I have other things going that I consider, well, this is the real me, but, so I, it's a mixed life at this point. Um, could you articulate a little bit? What? Could you articulate a little bit on um, your relationship with Greenberg? At, at the beginning, he supported you. He was one of your biggest supporters in the early 50s. And then there, there seemed to have been a rift. Could you articulate uh, a rift relationship between? with? Yeah, with Clem Greenberg, you're yes, talking Yes, Clement about? Greenberg. Yeah. Oh, you wanted me to talk about the rift? Well, no, everything. Of course. A rift involves a romance, right? Uh, well, what do you, I'm not sure I understand what you want to hear. Do we, uh, well, how we disagreed intellectually, or? He was an early supporter of yours. Uh, when you That's not true. Uh, uh, On top of it, I mean, the reason that I, I got to, I admired him for a very long time. I, uh, that's why I say, to sit here and talk after I've spent a whole chapter on it in my right. book becomes sort of like it's like, you know, a, a drop in the bucket. I, uh, Clem Greenberg wrote a very terrific article of my first exhibition, which I never forgot him for, naturally. But he, uh, it got complicated in the art world. And he, his sort of, finally his ideas began to exclude me, in other words, there was uh, a certain kind of works that he liked, and that they were major works, and everything else was minor works. And usually, anything that had to do with figures was considered not in the mainstream and things like that. And so, uh, I, I wouldn't refer to my work as figurative, but somehow, I guess, in those days, you used that term. And there were very big arguments at the artist club and things like that. The uh, those. Is there value or is there, is abstract art have any so redeeming social qualities and things like that? And so the, there was always figurative art and abstract art. I think that I don't consider my work to be figurative art, although there are figures that can be recognized. Greenberg, I guess, uh, was very tough and he was part, he was actually tough in life too. I mean, he, uh, he started fights. He so that in a way, maybe his writing was some kind of, uh, extension of this aggression that he had in him, and that when it came to writing, he had to make these very hard. He was knocking people out of the ring. You, you can't go. He, I mean, he'd, he'd write a sentence, and it would be as if he struck someone. So I, I think I began to see it. He also was a boyfriend of Helen Frankenthaler's, and I think that I knew her. She was with the, we were in the same gallery, so there was a social aspect. To it, I, I had to put things in those terms. I think I could just say that I, I admired him. It was, I had a conflict. He was a very admired man. He wrote lots of long articles, and he brought to the fore 
I mean, he could say that in some way he made American paintings seem important, even though he chose certain ones to seem important. It then flowed over into other areas. I mean, in other words, the shift from Paris to New York began to include other people than what Greenberg, you know, mentioned as good. I, I sort of agree with you that he did, by excluding figuration, uh, make abstraction into a sort of dogma that his own dogma that I didn't think in the 60s really held up because there was a lot of very important figurative work going on and uh, you're, you're a prime example. Thank you. <laughs> has, has, uh, do you think fame has adversely or favorably affected your art or? What's that? Do you think fame has affected the way you approach your art favorably? I, think it's very, I don't know. It's a, it's, a, it's a funny thing. I mean, Jesus Christ is more famous. Uh, at the, and from moment to moment, we, we know other people who are very famous. I don't know what constitutes fame in the art world. I would say that. Well, do you feel famous? I say with the, what? Do you feel it yourself? Do you feel famous? Do I feel famous? Can I admit that I feel famous in front of 150 people? Sure. Um, I think a lot of people know me, and I'm very surprised about how many people know me, actually. And I think a lot of people know me, don't even know what my work is, so that's it's sort of always sort of slightly depressing, but I guess I should enjoy it in some way. Uh, I don't know if people would get up in the subway to let me take their seat because I'm famous, but... Uh, You, you know, Tennessee well, let's Williams. Let's see how long it lasts. Tennessee it's Williams once said that the wolf at the door of the artist is not hunger or poverty; it's fame. And uh, he felt that it destroyed him. I mean, obviously, it hasn't destroyed you. You know, and but the other side of that coin is, you know, Gore Vidal said there that we're really entering an age now, or we've entered an age, he said it about 10 years ago, where artists and writers will never have the fame that they once had, where, where it's all been, becomes a, an issue of celebrity, where, you know, it's the Joey Buttafuoco's and the, that whole... Because of television? Yes, yeah. <clears throat> Well, I think at any given moment uh, in history, uh, there were certain things that were more, uh, got the attention of people more than art, I think. I mean, generals and politicians and philosophers. That's really long, isn't it? That. Yeah. Oh. We, we got a question over here, Bernita. Okay, I'll try to get distracted. Ask a question. Uh, you seemed a little reluctant to want to talk about Frank O'Hara, but I'm reading his biography, and uh, you're mentioned prominently, and I'm wondering what kind of influence he was on... Well, that helps, right? Um, I'm wondering what kind of influence he was on you and the whole scene in general. What, was he a very stimulating kind of guy, or... You know, Who, what, Frank? Yeah, Frank O'Hara. What yeah. was he like? You know, you want to hear about Frank O'Hara? Yeah. yeah. All right. There's, there's a lot in the book, too. Some great stories about, about all these. Having painted Washington Crossing the Delaware, what does painting, a major painting, do for an artist? Is that aesthetically, intellectually, where does it take you to undertake such an endeavor? So, that, so I think that it really answered the, to the question that he asked aside so from giving you all this history, is that uh, I think that it's, it's really simple and uh, the, if you do something that people would consider important, like for instance, uh, even though we criticize and things like that, we do, if you think about the Civil War, it's a very serious thing. You bring up the Civil War, you're gonna get an audience, everybody's gonna really take you very seriously. And so there are, I think that that may have been and so perhaps they would then move over into the area that not only did I pick a serious subject, but these works are serious. Though if you really look at the painting, it, it was pretty absurd. I mean, we don't have a photograph, we don't have a reproduction. I hope that lays to rest the... Yeah. 
Everybody, oh, I just then I thought I'd go a step further to, on this question. Uh, <clears throat> throughout my life, uh, people have viewed that painting. I was very lucky. I, I, two years after I did it, uh, I actually, it was bought by the Museum of Modern Art. I mean, I, I sort of fell down when they told me, and I think I was going to get $2,500 or $4,000, I don't remember. For me at that time, when you have 20 bucks in the bank and everything like that, it was very thrilling. But no one who ever wrote about it ever knew my Tolstoy connection. Everybody wrote about it as a connection to the, uh, the painting up at the Met, the uh, Lutz painting. And I don't remember even seeing it. I also thought paintings like that were sort of corny and academic, although it, it's sort of an interesting painting now that I've gotten older and more generous. But uh, I, uh, so that, that's lived with me, and each time I come into a public situation, I try to put, present the real story. Anyway. Thank you. Uh, Larry started out, as probably most of you know, at, as a young jazz musician in New York, and tell us how you made, you made the segue from it's a good term, because that's what they use in music. Right. You go from one part of, say, from one song to another, it's called a segue, and change keys and things like that. How did I make the segue? I, there, here it is, the most, in retrospect, one of the most important moves in my own life. Everybody has their own sense of drama about their lives and things like that. So I look back and I, I realize that I went from jazz to art in this rather odd way, uh, I think. Maybe everybody has a story about how they became artists that are just as peculiar, but uh, I was playing with a band, and uh, it was called Johnny Morris Band. It was sort of a bunch of sort of young swinging beboppers and smoke pots and thought we were very smart and wore the very terrific clothes or whatever. And, but no one ever wanted to go to sleep with us. But at any rate, uh, <laughs> Um, the piano player, Jack Freilicker, does it ring a bell? Had a wife called Jane Freilicker. Jack and Jane, Jane came up to visit her husband. She was, she was, maybe she was 19 at the time, and very odd looking from my point of view, knowing dancers. Actually, before I even played with bands, I played in uh, strip clubs and you know, I thought I was very, I played blues and, you know, and that most of my life took place at night and I had this sort of romantic notion of what, what that meant. And so I, also the women that you do see, in, especially in the, the part connected with music, were very usually exploited their whatever sexuality they had to gain the, uh, the admiration of the audience. And... Uh, so Jane Fallica actually didn't wear high heels. She wore low heel shoes. And I thought, at first I thought, oh, I see there are girls like this. In other words, I never saw them before. Even my mother wore high heels. But anyway, and uh, so we, but she was an artist. But she hadn't done it for quite a while. In other words, she was this guy's wife. and. Uh, they came from Brighton Beach. She was a very smart girl. And uh, we started to, in the afternoons, which is in my book, uh, we would play. There was nothing to do. We had this job at night. And we would just put in some bunch of cabins somewhere in the country. And the guys really didn't know what to do with themselves. So they, they either smoked pot or they played poker. <laughs> so <clears throat> I smoked the pot sometime, but I would I can't, couldn't stand poker after a while. I mean, it just, and it suddenly, I criticized it. I really thought that it's kind of a silly way to spend the whole day. And the Jane Freilich has suggested we try art. Why don't we try art? So her husband, Jack, <laughs> Jack, uh, Jane, and Larry began to do things. And she sort of made suggestions. And I, I began using color and things like that. And I, I really liked it. And uh, I also immediately transformed this whole idea of art into something that's more uh, not glamorous, but that 
It had an, uh, overtones that were suddenly more serious, and I think possibly the whole idea, I don't know if really all these things took place at one moment, but I mean, the whole idea of a, of a life uh, full of, uh, you know, drugs and uh, very, very thrilling physically. I mean, it's hard to tell you how thrilling it was to play with, to play music with big bands and at a certain point to be hired to hear 16 other musicians coming in at the same beat or whatever it is and a fantastic drummer. Uh, so it was, it was very attractive to me on that physical level. But there was, seemed to be something about painting that had to do with the fact that you, did, you could do it alone. I'm a very gregarious type, and you can see I don't have too much trouble talking, and I like people and things like that, but there was something suddenly about being able to do something by yourself and actually doing something that had made some sense in a creative way, uh, although I hate that word. But uh, and so I think I started to move towards art, and we came back to the city at the end of this uh, gig in Maine, and... Uh, Jane, on the basis of my wanting to do it and sort of taking up what she suggested, decided to get more serious about herself, which works back and forth that way. And we, we enrolled at Hoffman, so we went to Hoffman. So that's how I began uh, painting out of that. A few weeks up in Old Orchard, Maine. I don't know if any of you know it. Old Orchard, Maine is like Coney Island up somewhere in the woods. It's a very <laughs> peculiar place. <laughs> Do, does, the, does the music affect your painting? Oh, yeah. Is there a so I, I was trying to say why I actually never answered questions about it in a positive way. I always would say that they're two separate experiences. One is audio and one is visual, and uh, what goes in your ears has a way of traveling to your spine for some reason. And that uh, it's closer to sex, I would say, uh, sound, and uh, unless you're weird and people in this audience by looking get sex, you know, feel sexual, but um, I uh, decided that Alzheimer's setting in again, one second. Uh, oh yes, uh, the, so the catch. Oh, so uh, by, by not uh, uh, like wanting to talk about it because of all these reasons I just told you, I ignored the fact that there was something in my work or something I felt about it and the strange thing is that it came out in, a, starting about 10, 12 years ago, maybe even a little more, uh, my, I began playing music in a much more uh, regular way with bands and things like that and finally got our own band. And the, one of the bands we had grew out of a, a kind of experience I have at the uh, Parsons School of Design. And uh, David Levy, who was the Dean, Dean David Levy. Uh, we got some jobs actually with the band out in colleges all over the, the West, the Midwest, the Southwest, which because there were three or four members of the group artists and David Levy was the head of Parsons, insisted on having seminars. And we'd play, like a situation like this, we, the band would play, and then we sat down to a symposium about art. So the question was to both determine what's the relationship between jazz and art. I took a very stubborn position. For some reason, I wouldn't, I couldn't sort of, I didn't think there was much. But now I, I realize that I think that if I were to say anything about my work without sounding as if I'm trying to praise myself, I would try, I would say that there's a certain kind of energy that jazz insists on, a certain kind of keeping you interested by shifts and faints and rhythm and in notes and things like that. And uh, I think that that is there in my thing, that I feel as if, aside from the subject, everything like that, something has to be lively. And I use that word. So I would say that has, then there's the actual thing where each song that we used to play has a certain chordal structure. You go from the first to the fourth, back to the first, maybe to the third minor. It's got like, and as time went on, people thought and thought of more sort of interesting and beautiful resolutions to certain chordal uh, progressions. Well, the first chorus on these songs, at least in my time, was usually the melody. 
I've got rhythm, I've got rhythm. So that would be the first thing. But underneath I've got rhythm in that sense, there are sounds, certain sounds are going on. Well, by the time you get to the second chorus, you're, uh, you're forgetting about the melody and you're really sort of going ahead in some creative way to create jazz, music, whatever. And I think that painters who painted figuratively, I did, I think that I felt that I could take the figure or whatever I was painting, perhaps make you recognize what it was about, but at the same time impose on it a certain kind of energy and, you know, uh, sort of knocking it apart. And if you didn't recognize it as, as a thing, I didn't care. So I mixed the both. I would have some vestiges of realism or things that were to do with the figure, and then I would break that up. And I think that came out of jazz four years later. Go ahead. Okay. Be you've mentioned sex. I've mentioned sex. Sex. Uh, there's a lot of sex in what the world. We're, we're all living in the age of no wet sex. And, uh, but I'm curious, uh, have, the, have the feminists weighed in? Um, well, on your book, have you they usually. One woman said to me after she read the book, "How do you feel about your your whole life having treated women as horribly as you did?" <laughs> I, I, for the life of me, didn't know what she was talking about, and so uh, that's one mm -hmm. response. Uh, close friends who, of mine who have a degree of intelligence and who are in the arts and writers and things like that. I never got anything like that from them. On the other hand, most people are so busy with their own business, they didn't, you know, you don't, you don't take out time a minute to talk to someone about what they've done. You, you go to a French show, you look at it, and I try to pretend a certain thing that one should have opinions and, and give them to your friends or something to make them feel as if They've done something that has inspired some thought. But at any rate, uh, I, uh, I think that the way I behave in certain instances, which appears in the book, uh, could, under today's you know, way of thinking about how you're supposed to behave with women, so for men, how to behave with women, could seem as if it's a pretty insensitive little chap that was running around there. And so, from that point of view, I would think that feminists uh, would not like it. On the other hand, uh, I don't know how to correct the picture unless they sat down and had a discussion with me. I didn't want to write a book in which I was really making excuses for the way I behaved. I felt it would have a very a much stronger uh, impact by presenting it a little bit the way it, it happened then. Instead of saying, oh, of course, you know, I don't feel that way anymore. I mean, I'm very sensitive how women feel about these things and you shouldn't really refer to their sex organs in that way that you do and things like that. And I thought that would really be disgusting and cowardly. So I didn't do it. But it, uh, there are people who didn't like some of the things that I said, which, you know, we all, uh, we all start out, I mean, no one starts out, you know, 100% beautiful. Maybe some of you who later become monks, nuns. <laughs> well, I want to say I didn't ask that question lightly. I mean, it was something that I thought about reading the book. I was wondering, and the only conclusion I could come to was that it's, uh, it's actually healthy to see how far men have come. I know we have a long way to go, but <laughs> it's it's uh, it's healthy to see how far we've come in our thinking about women and talking about them, and the way that we we treat them. Yes, I would say that probably if you want to get on the subject, we could totally say we could get completely hung up on the subject. So we'll try to end it now. Yes. I would say that <laughs> I would say that a good many men in this audience given the age and things like that, are criminals, I mean, on today's basis, in their relation to women. And so, uh, <laughs> you'll have to live with it. Okay. Talk about art. Yeah, it's that's what I said. I said that'll be the last statement on it. 
Okay. We'll move on. I'm inclined to talk about the sex and drugs, so if any of you have any questions. So. <laughs> You're not going to? Uh, I don't know how far I want to go with it. I mean, how far? Satisfy your curiosity. Uh, you still doing dope? The Goyle, <laughs> Oscar Wilde said the only thing you regret are the things you didn't do, so I could actually <laughs> almost make a case for that, that I, what I regret is what I didn't do. Anyway, go ahead. Let you, let's skip the dope. Uh, you're playing around these days with your band? Is it still the 13th Street Band? <laughs> we get into bed once in a while. Uh, I, uh, yeah. No, it's not the East 13th Street any longer. It's five pieces. It's called the Climax Band. Again, a sort of a dumb joke idea. I can't sort of resist. But it's the Climax Band. It's five pieces. And uh, we play. We get all sorts of jobs, strangely enough. In fact, we were playing right here in uh, Greenwich Village recently, uh, every Sunday at, at a place called Knickerbocker. I don't know if any of you have e ever eaten that food there. You get a lot of, you get a lot of food. I mean... One order could satisfy easily two people, especially two people on a diet, no problem. <laughs> but anyway, yes, I play quite a bit, and uh, we write music for the band, and uh, it seems to be about the only other thing. You know, I don't go to bars, and I don't, you know, it's sort of hopeless in the area of women and things like that. So I just leave it alone, and I find myself actually enjoying uh you know, playing and doing something with that. But we play for the, a lot of very curious organizations because of my relationship to art. We got a lot of jobs that the, if the, the UJA is having an art sale or something like that, so they, they somehow hired me with the band. So they're glad to listen to jazz, but I don't think they're listening very hard. Do I listen to music? Listen to certain music, days. Yes. Certain days I want to, at a certain point in the work, if I've already kind of overcome the beginning of a work, uh, somehow I want it quiet when I begin something. I also, when I was younger, thought, look, and, uh, I remember de Kooning, we were out one summer somewhere, and he was, he was with the Castellis, they gave him a room, it was a very 19th century notion, they put up this painter, things like that. He would listen to Mozart, Bach, and things like that. And I used to hear it down the road, you know. So I used to think, what's making, as you're working, okay, you can think to yourself, well, I really do best when I'm happy, when I work, if I'm happy. Instead of being, somebody just left me, and I got all these bills, and my kids are pain in the ass, and, you know, and then you go into the studio and you stop painting. I... Some people can't paint under those conditions. I don't know if anybody can. But at any rate, uh, I began to think, I wondered whether by listening to something that's very exciting.